Hey friends, this is Visionary 3D, and today we're gonna learn how to practically use compute shaders in a web GPU. Compute shaders are fascinating because they allow running large simulations on the GPU, and in our case, on the web platform. A compute shader is a small piece of program which helps us perform really fast parallel algorithms. We're going to focus on the most important things you need to understand to get started writing your first practical compute shader. Practical means we're not going to build a demo. Tools like this are cool because they solve problems. We're going to use compute shaders to build a fast math library for matrices. But using this matrix library, I'm going to train a very basic neural network in this episode. Don't worry about the math too much because the math that we're going to cover today will be extremely simple. The neural network we're going to build is designed to understand and recognize handwritten digits. The dataset we'll be using is called the MNIST dataset. The first step is going to be loading this dataset and sending it to my full screen fragment shader. Using this code, I'm going to calculate an index which I'm going to use to read the color if you want to learn more about fragment shaders and shader programming in general, you can take a look at my free shader programming crash course, as well as my introduction to web GPU. I also offer one-to-one -one mentoring video calls on shader programming, 3D web development, and 3JS. So if you're interested, check out the description down below. You only need to know the basics of JavaScript, however, in order to follow along with this video. The setup that I showed you so far is only to visualize the data set we'll be working with and has nothing to do with compute shaders. In order to train a neural network to understand these images, we need to have a way to handle large matrix operations. When we add two matrices together, we get a third matrix, which is the result. The result of a matrix operation. A tensor is an array of numbers. A vector is a one-dimensional tensor. A matrix is a two-dimensional tensor, so it can be represented by an array of an array of numbers. Under the hood, this is actually an array of pointers, which each point to an array of numbers. A 3D tensor will be the same, but with having one more dimension. You can clearly see that this data structure is becoming more and more complex as we're increasing the number of dimensions we're gonna use a much better structure. The values of the matrix can be rearranged to represent a one-dimensional array instead. But given some X and Y values, we should be able to get access to the number in the flattened version of the array. So to get an index, we multiply the Y by the width of the matrix, and then add X as the offset. X is just the X, but every time we increase the Y value, we have to skip an entire row to get to the next point with the same X. That's why we multiply the Y by the number of columns or the width of the matrix. So to represent a tensor in memory, you need at least two things. A buffer that holds the data and a view to help us look at that data. The view is usually called a tensor shape. Think about it. We can represent any tensor with a one-dimensional array. This is mind-blowing to me. You don't have to change the underlying data. What you need to change is the shape. The first lesson I want to give you in this video is always start with the problem. Try to figure out what the best data structures are to help you solve that problem in the most effective way. I decided to implement some basic tensor operations in JavaScript first. Pure JavaScript lets us forget about the GPU side of things for now and get a glance of the basic functionality that we need. For two matrices of the same size, an element-wise addition operation is extremely simple. It's like we're aligning the two matrices exactly on top of each other, and that gives us a matrix with the exact same size as the result. We loop through all the numbers and then using the same index, add and store the values in the matrix. Addition, multiplication, subtraction, and division are not all that interesting, but what we care about very much is the efficiency of matrix-matrix multiplication. Here's a basic implementation in 
JavaScript. In this operation, unlike addition, we are required to create a new matrix because the shape of the resulting matrix is fundamentally different. A sum operation is implemented like this. We create a variable to hold the sum amount and we accumulate the entire values in the loop. What we learn at this stage is that every tensor operation is a function. A function has inputs and outputs. So a tensor operation has inputs and outputs. I'm going to show you what I think is the best method for creating these operations in a web GPU. Today, I'm not going to get into the implementation of sum because that's a reduce operation and the web GPU implementation will be massively different. Three things will matter when you want to work with compute shaders. The shader, which is just some code written in shading language, the bind groups, which are the inputs and the outputs of the shader, and the command encoder, which lets you encode commands for the GPU to execute. The shader is just some code written in shading language, and that means that this code is going to live in our JavaScript application as a string. Strings are powerful because you can manipulate them. The code that we're going to write in this video is freely available in the description. We're going to use the web GPU's shading language, which is also known as Wixel. U32 defines an unsigned 32-bit integer. A vec3 is just a constructor stating that we have a vector with three different components. The component's names are X, Y, and Z, or R, G, B, in order. You can use these names interchangeably. F32 defines a 32-bit float, and wrapped in a VEC3 constructor, we get a three-dimensional F32 vector. To create a class, we use the struct keyword. Here I'm defining the inputs and the outputs of our compute shader. The first binding is a uniform buffer, which holds some data that is the same across every single instance of the shader. The second binding is the array of values from our input matrix. And the third binding is the output of our compute shader, because we allowed read and write access in our definition. And so we can write to that buffer after we compute the result. A function is defined like this, and this function specifically checks to see if a 3D point is out of bounds, finally returning a boolean which can be either true or false. The main body of our compute shader is defined here. We give our compute shader a work group size of 64, which I'll talk about in a moment. In our main function, we also get access to a couple of built-in variables, and here we're specifically asking for the global ID. And I'll also talk about what that exactly is in a few minutes. We finally get to the main logic of our compute shader, which checks to see if our global ID is out of bounds or not. If it is out of bounds, we will simply return by doing nothing. After that, we can do some computation, which in here means adding and storing the value in the output buffer. If we compare this to our simple implementation in JavaScript, we can see some clear differences. The first difference is that we're supposed to clearly define the inputs and the outputs of our shader. The second difference is that we're supposed to check and see if we are out of bounds of the intended range. And finally, we have to deal with something called the work group size. And then and only then we're able to do our simple calculation. A compute shader is like a parallel for loop. You place the main body of the for loop inside the main function of your compute shader. The main function of the compute shader does some mathematical calculation based on the thread index, aka the global ID. This means that the only tool you have available that lets you do different things in each thread is the global thread ID. So when you're writing a compute shader, it's extremely important for you to do all of your calculations based on this index. Let's take a step back and talk about how this piece of code is going to run on the GPU. The modern GPUs have a huge number of cores. My GPU has 7,680 to be exact, but your GPU probably differs. Web GPU has designed a powerful system that works with every single GPU, which I will simplify. 
The smallest piece of the GPU compute hierarchy is a work item or a thread. I'll read a portion of this great article by Ralph Levine to explain this. A thread in GPU compute is like a traditional CPU thread, but with some differences. While on CPU the cost of spawning a thread is significant, on a GPU it is quite cheap, and often the many small threads pattern is the best way to achieve performance. The hardware model of the GPU is often described as single instruction multiple threads, or SIMT, which is similar to more traditional single instruction multiple data, or SIMD. The main function of our shader code is going to run on many, many threads, hence they all perform the same task, but many, many times in parallel. The global ID built-in variable, which we saw in the shader code, is the global thread ID. The work group size, which we saw in our basic compute shader code, describes the number of threads we are going to spawn per each work group. This leads us to the next important piece of the GPU compute hierarchy, a work group. A work group is a group of threads generally executed in parallel. All the threads in a work group are scheduled to run together. In web GPU, the workload is modeled as a three-dimensional grid, where each cube is a thread, and threads are grouped into bigger cubes to form a work group. When we define the size of a work group, we're defining the size in three dimensions. Meaning, if you don't specify a component, it'll get set to one. Hence, this is equivalent to this. The next important piece we're going to consider is dispatching work groups. A dispatch is a unit of computation all sharing the same inputs and outputs. We can only dispatch work groups, meaning if we want to run 21 threads with a work group size of 64, we need to run the shader at least 64 times to get this done. So we can't run individual threads we can only dispatch work groups. This will cause something unexpected called over dispatching. We only wanted to run the code for 21 threads, but it's going to run for 64 threads instead. That's exactly why we need to check that we're not exceeding the bounds of our GPU program. To calculate the number of work groups you need to run, you can divide 21 by the work group size, which is 64 and that'll give you 0.32. However, using a ceiling function on that number, you can get the minimum number of work groups. In this case, ceiling 0.32 is one, so you only need to dispatch one work group. Now with all of this in mind, let's run our web GPU compute shader. First, we're going to define an operation class, which is going to handle the shader code for each matrix operation. We're going to construct a uniform buffer, which is a helper class you can get access to in the description. This uniform buffer will give our shader access to some important information, like the size of the matrices, the bounds of the compute shader, and overall, things like that. Then we're going to define our bind group layout, which describes the types of inputs and outputs we're sending to the shader. Then we're going to generate our shader code and do some string manipulation to inject a custom function that does the computation that we need. And then we're going to create a web GPU pipeline, which basically constructs a compute pipeline using the shader module and our bind group layouts. In web GPU, you need to define your bind group layouts and be very specific about the type of the bindings you are sending to the GPU. Finally, we're going to call compute, which is going to create a compute pass encoder. The encoder is going to invoke the GPU to execute our instructions. We call dispatch work groups, which takes the number of work groups we want to dispatch. We calculate that number by taking the number of threads we want to dispatch and dividing it by the work group size and using a seal to compute the minimum number of work groups we need to run in order to get the job done. Let's talk about some of the important pieces I left out intentionally for the sake of simplicity. First of all, let's summarize all the steps for creating a single matrix operation. 
We need to create some matrices with some data. Create a matrix operation compute shader, set the matrices we want as inputs and outputs using bind groups, update the uniforms, and finally, executing the shader by dispatching a number of work groups. In order to read and write data in GPU land, we need to create something called a GPU buffer. A GPU buffer to me is an array that lives on the GPU. A GPU buffer can be created by providing two main parameters. A size which is specified in bytes and a usage which we set by utilizing the GPU buffer usage flags. When creating a GPU buffer, you need to be very careful with the size because if the size of the buffer exceeds the web GPU limits, the buffer creation will fail. At the start of the video, when I loaded the MNIST dataset originally, I got an error with no good explanation for this exact reason. My crude fix for this was dividing the number of MNIST images by two, and that solved the buffer creation problem. In this instance, we're utilizing the copy destination flag, which means that this buffer is going to be used as the destination in a GPU copy operation. Copying to this GPU buffer allows us to move data from one matrix to another very fast and easily. We're also utilizing the copy source flag, which means that this buffer is going to be used as the source in a GPU copy operation. This is useful when we want to read the data back to the CPU later. Finally, we're utilizing a storage flag, which creates a storage buffer. Storage buffers are large arrays of data which are suitable for our use case. The operation shader is going to run using everything we provided. The problem is that to read the GPU buffer data, we have to move the GPU buffer to CPU land. To do this, we're going to create a staging buffer. And by copying the GPU buffer into that staging buffer, we are going to be able to call map async, which is going to give us the array buffer of the result. I'm going to build a couple of operations and store them in an operation manager class. In this way, we're creating all the operations at initialization time. Finally, it's time to use this matrix compute system. I'm going to create two matrices with some random integer values between one and four. And then I'm going to create a third matrix to hold the multiplication data. I'm going to print the first two matrices and then I'm going to perform the multiplication process and print the resulting matrix. And if we check the console, it works. We're getting exactly what we want. I spent an entire week adding more operations, optimizing the system, and finally running the neural network training loop on the MNIST dataset. After all of the optimization tricks I implemented, I managed to get 78% accuracy in four seconds of training time. Initially, I wanted to talk about optimization and I thought that this video is already too long, so it's probably better if I talk about it in my next devlog. If you're interested in seeing that, click the like button and I'll make sure to make more web GPU content in future episodes. If you want to learn compute shaders really quickly, I offer one-to-one -one mentoring. For booking a call, check the description down below. If you want to work with me on a project and build a real-time 3D application on the web using 3GS or WebGPU, my contact information is available in the description. Before I say goodbye, let me give you some amazing resources for further learning compute shaders and WebGPU. I highly recommend you read this article from Surma because it's going to give you a lot more detailed information about compute shaders. I used this article as a reference when I was creating this video, so definitely check it out. It's amazing. I also highly recommend you check out Web GPU Fundamentals, as it gives you a set of great articles to help you learn Web GPU. That's it for this video, guys. I hope you learned something today, and I'll see you in the next videos.